Precious God and Father, we thank you today for the privilege that we have to gather into your house and to worship you. We thank you, Lord, for the great price that you paid for us at Calvary for the salvation of our soul. And we thank you, Lord, for this time of year when we celebrate your birth. Lord, but you, don't, you didn't remain a baby. You went through a life representing your father, living a perfect life, and desiring that your children would follow after you. And the only way that we can do that is by accepting Christ as our Savior and Lord. Whenever we have the anointing of the power of the Spirit of God, we can live as pleasing unto you if we commit ourselves, Lord, to living for you. We thank you, Lord, because we know that you're mindful of each of us and the difficulties that we're having in our life. Lord, we thank you that you have promised to take care of us. So as we live according to the instructions of your word, we can pray and expect you to come to our rescue. That does not mean we'll not have difficulties, but it does mean that in the midst of all the difficulties, Lord, we have your help. We can lean heavily upon the everlasting arms of our Lord, knowing that you never fail. Regardless of how difficult the situation may be, we can have victory in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We ask, Lord, that you bless each family that attends this church. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to catch a vision of those that are slipping through our fingers because we are not representing you like we ought to. We ask your forgiveness, Lord, in the areas that we're lacking. We ask, Lord, that you give us the strength and the help that we need to proclaim the gospel of Christ to our family and our neighbors and our workplace, Lord. Our heart desires to be able to win souls for you. Lord, it's your desire that men and women throughout the world come to know Christ as their personal Savior. And the only way that people can be saved is by calling upon your precious holy name. We ask God that you should help us to become more soul conscious than we have ever been before. And help us, Lord, that we might win souls, O oh God. Bless our church and minister to the needs of our people, Lord. God, we ask that you extend your tender arm of mercy to every family and meet the needs, Lord, as only you can. We thank you, Lord, for the great price that you paid for us for our salvation. And we thank you, Lord, because we know that you'll take care of us. We're depending upon you, and, and regardless of the circumstances of life, which becomes really difficult at times, we still know, Lord, that we can depend upon you. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings upon us. Bless Brother Ray today as he teaches the lesson. Help our hearts to be receptive to your word. Bless our pastor, Lord, as he delivers the message this morning. And help us to realize, Lord, in this day in which we live, that there's ever been a time that we need to live according to your word is today. The world seems to be getting worse. People on uh, in every area of our lives, Lord, are going against God in most cases rather than for Him. And there's ever been a time that we need to tow the mark and lift up the standard as the day in which we live. Help us to become more so conscious than we have ever been before and take advantage of all the opportunities that we have to win souls for Christ. Bless us today and give us a good day, Lord, and when we leave this place, which they surely has been good to have been in the house of the Lord, because you met with us. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings upon us. Lord, thank you for your past blessings and the blessings that's going to happen in the future. We're looking for great and mighty things to take place in our church. Lord, the healings for those that are sick and afflicted, 
salvation for those that are lost. Praises, honor, and glory coming from the lips of those that are saved according to who you are. Bless us together, Lord. Bind us and draw us closer to you than we have ever been before. In your precious name we pray and ask these blessings. Amen. 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 About an important subject here today, uh, probably the most important subject you know, that anybody could talk about. The subject of love. It's a good word. That's very right, amen. And we know that uh, when we talk about love, the kind of love we're talking about is not that I love apple pie or I love to sleep, stuff like that. <laughs> but we're talking about God they love, the kind of love that God has for us and the kind of love that God expects us to have for Him and for each other. It's a different kind of love. And you know, we all know... We love each other. <laughs> that's right. We all we can correct, uh, First Corinthians, it talks about the kind of love we're talking about here. Paul uh, breaks it down. Um, uh, love is important. He talks about it in First John as well. About uh, how God is love. And how this time of year we celebrate Christmas because of the birth of Christ. And that's when love come down from above. The manna from above. It come down, the bread of life come down, the light of life come down, the light of the world come down. Love came down. And God is expressing His love by sending Jesus down from a human being, a baby being born, uh, that He can go out and be a demonstration for us and teach us and educate us and show us what love really is. Not the kind of love that people know about or think about, but the kind of love that uh, comes from God, which is going to be a lot different sometimes than the uh, kind of love that people talk about in the world today. And, uh, God demonstrated that, uh, His love for all humanity, by sending Jesus to die for our sins. And because of that, and if we truly believe it, we should, in, in response to that, Love God, of course, and then show our love for each other that God wants us to do. Uh, and it, you know, if we really have that love inside of it, it, it promotes behavior in our daily life that is evident to people around us that you know that the love of God is in us. <clears throat> Somebody give me an example of how we would express our love towards God. We got an example of how a person shows their love towards God by giving to someone who can never repay you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can show our love towards God by showing love to each other and to others, because that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to to love each, love Him first and foremost, and if we truly do love Him first and foremost, we're going to love other people because that's what God wants us to do. And it's evident in our, you know, the, um, say for example that, you know, I'm out and I see my brother or my sister I ain't seen in a long time. I'll go up to him and I'll hug your neck. I'll smile and laugh and, you know, we're, you know, reminisce for a minute and that kind of a thing. And, uh, and people see that and they say, well, they must, you know, be family. They must love each other and care about each other because the way they're acting to each other, what they're saying to each other, and the way they're treating each other. And likewise, God expects that from us to everybody else. For example, if I see you know, one of y'all, or uh, example is I go to Rosa sometime, and then I see Margie. I go over to her, and I grab her and hug her neck, and we smile, we laugh, and uh, we're showing love for each other, just like God expects us to do, because we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And I love that. He expects us to love everybody, to love our neighbor, uh, which yeah, can be a complete yeah. stranger. And that can be a challenge to do at times. Sometimes the challenge is to love your own family. You know, the people at church or whatever it may be, you know, spiritual family or biological family, sometimes it's difficult to love those because of the, uh, the way they act and react to mm -hmm. you and can be, uh, can be hard to do. But God expects that. Like when Jesus came down and what he did, he died for our sins. Uh, we didn't deserve it, can't earn it. And, uh, a lot of people don't even believe it, don't even appreciate it. But because his love was so great for us, he did it anyway. Whether we love him or not, he shows the love. And since God 
He's loving his enemies, and he expects others to do likewise. And I know it can be a challenge, uh, a real challenge at times, but that's what God wants us to do. And by doing that, it shows that the, you know, the, the Jesus is the Lord of our life, and that we live our life. Uh, he reigns in our life, and we live our life for him. So if we want to or not, we do it. And once we get enough of that love in us from the Holy Spirit, we want to do it. It's not something that we have to force ourselves to do. <clears throat> it just naturally comes out of you. When you get so much love inside of you, it just bubbles out. And you, you can't help it. Like if somebody gets so full of anger and rage and frustrated, it just comes out in their you know, uh, everyday life more or less because they're living a frustrated, aggravated life. And everything is anger, anger, anger. The way they talk, the way they act, the way they treat other people can be rude and rough. But when you're so full of so full of love and joy from the Holy Spirit, your everyday life, love's going to come out of you. Peace is going to come out of you. Joy's going to come out of you. And it'll show in your everyday life, the way you talk to people, the way you treat yourself, the way you treat others, it'll just come out of you naturally. The only something that you have to take training. That's it. Well, well, why do you do it? It's trying to have my friend for life. Not my friend. Friend, friend, friend. My friend for life, meaning they, 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 they post event from they, they, that then we don't invent uh, um Stephen one 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 of my top you know no mean when we we will then tell me anything to my dinner. Every time we 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 turn to turn in, we 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 turn to turn life, love, and all. They 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 turn inside of me and put my love to my 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 friend for 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 life. Yep, yep. I don't love coming out of me. I put it in this for a reason, not keep it bottled up to ourselves. We can love ourselves, but we can let it flow out of us and love others. And express that in our daily life. Daily life. <clears throat> Sometimes even, you know, like we're talking about the, the words that we say, or the words that we use, can be good or bad. And there's sometimes, like being a parent, sometimes a child may think you're being mean, and that you don't love them because you're disciplined. But that discipline is a form of love. So love is not always being gentle and sweet and nice and kind and as people would expect. I mean, it is, we do that things because of love. But also, if you love somebody, you may rebuke that person. Uh, somebody in church, if you have a child, you may, you know, discipline your child uh, because you love your child. And God is the same way towards us. We're His children. And He treats us the same way. He may rebuke us. He may discipline us in some form or fashion. He does it because He loves us. Not because He doesn't. Because we... I've sinned and messed up and he hates us and he wants to send us to hell. That's not the case. He disciplines us at times because he loves us, just like we do our children. And the Bible tells us in times and you know our brothers and sisters in Christ are, you know, sometimes we're we're to rebuke our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, you know, uh, if they're uh, doing things that they shouldn't be doing, uh, to let them know that uh, it's wrong and uh, we need to you know get on the right track, do the right thing. That God calls us to do. Sometimes we wonder in our daily life, are we pleasing God by what we're doing, what we're saying, how we're acting, how we're reacting? Uh, you know, in our, our time, our talent, our money, or whatever. And the thing is that, yeah, I'm trying to sound Josh now. The thing is, <laughs> must be rubbing off on him. <laughs> he hasn't seen, I saw it in the video, so we're good. <laughs> is it, um, if, like the, Lord, like the Lord tells us to do. If we love God with all our heart, all our mind, and all our soul, if we do that, we're going to love our neighbor as ourselves as well because it, it just comes hand in hand like salt and pepper. It's just there. Uh, and if we, if we do that, all the other stuff will fall into place. How we live, how we act, how we react, how we spend our time, how we spend our talent, how we spend our money, all that will just fall right into place. If we put these two things first and foremost in our life. When I started teaching Sunday school some years back, one of the 
things that I used to say, I used to write on the board, is to, uh, if, if anybody, of all the lessons that I taught, of everything that I said and preached and teach, if you just remember this one little thing, is that we, we come here to learn, to live, to love. That's the most important thing we can do. <clears throat> and show our love to God and to mankind. That's what God wants us to do. And He tells us in His Word again and again and again that that is the most important thing that anybody can do is show love. But a proper form of love. Like I said, love can be discipline. Uh, love can be a lot of things. It comes in different forms of fashion. For example, let's say that I, you know, uh, as an act of love, uh, if, I had a, if I had a child, I mean, which I do, but if I had a little kid, and because my kid loved to eat candy, I just bought about a case, cases and cases of candy, let her eat, and, or he or she, or let her eat and chew all the junk they wanted to eat. And I said, well, I love my child, so I'm going to give my child what she wants, so she'll be happy. But actually, that's not, that's not the right way to do it. Love is you got to put a stop to it. Because sometimes good things, too much of a good thing, so to speak. Because if I let, continue to let that child eat and eat and eat, we know what's going to happen to them. So the things are going to happen to the body that shouldn't be happening. Teeth are going to rot and fall out. And that's not love. And that's the kind of love that God's talking about. It's a different kind of love. That love can have discipline in it when we correct our children. And discipline our children and show them, teach them, and train them. I was driving down the road, and I see a lady standing by the road, she got a flat tire. I feel bad for her. And so I got out of the car, and I see got a problem. And she had no trouble lady like that. So I was kind enough to help her change the tire. So I changed the tire, put flat everything in the trunk. But she offered me money. Well, I don't need money. I did it for my heart. Like Bob said, love your enemy. That you hate you, if I touch you, well, so you got to show them a little love. So that's why I did it. But she was going to give me 20 bucks or something. You keep it for yourself. I'd be all right. And she said, Thank you. I appreciate it. I said, well, you're a blessed day. She wore a job off and went my business. That's a good example. But that's a, that's a seed that's planted in God's love. And now you just pray for someone else to come by and water it and, and watch it grow. I mean, you know. I've seen people, like, they couldn't get the car started. I give them a jump. So yeah. I do that. I say a lot of time. Yeah. 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 Good citizen on top of that. Praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah. so we'll be reading a little bit uh, about love today. We're going to start out with uh, Luke chapter 10. And I'm going to start reading a couple of verses here. We'll go through them a few at a time. I'm going to read Luke chapter 10, 25 to 26. And it says this, And behold, a certain lawyer, well, I'm <clears throat> try this again, <clears throat> And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? So this lawyer is trying to, as the Pharisees and scribes used to do a lot, they were trying to uh, trip Jesus into saying something they could hold against him. That he was breaking the law, blasphemy, and wasn't uh, really a son, wasn't really a man of God because he was breaking the law, wasn't obeying God. So they asked him a question about, <clears throat> about this, about how to in inherit eternal life. And like a lot of times, Jesus answered their question with a question. Because he knew what their schemes were and what their plans were, and how they were trying to trick him and you know, make him look bad, so he would answer their question with a question to uh, get him on the right path. Same lawyers today. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. I don't have any lawyers in here, so I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> trying to, yeah, trying to trick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Jesus asked him about, the, you know, what does the law say? If he asked him about uh, what's he going to do to eternal life, you know, because this guy was you know, studying the scriptures. He knew the scriptures up and down. That's what his job was, what he did. He was a lawyer, so he knew the, knew the law, um, which would be, you know, back then the law was the scriptures. So he knew the scriptures, he knew the law. And he was trying, maybe he figured Jesus didn't know the law, didn't know that Jesus, didn't believe that Jesus wrote the law. Jesus wrote the, uh, <laughs> he was the law. So he's trying to trick him into saying something, and he asked him about the, well, what does the law say? And 
And so he's expecting the guy to, uh, <clears throat> the guy to answer, and then he can go on with his uh, little uh, what the law interprets. Because back then, and even today, uh, people uh, interpret uh, the laws, the scriptures, the way they want to do it. Yeah. They go by the word, more or less, rather than the principle of the law, or the principle of the word, and what the word is actually saying to us. Sometimes we uh, don't interpret it the way that we should, so we, we study and we learn and we train so we can understand it the way that God wants us to understand it, and not necessarily the way we want to understand it. So we can use it for our own uh, selfish aspects or whatever. But uh, God wants us to use it the way that he, he intended it to be used to show love and <clears throat> kindness toward each other and discipline. <clears throat> and if we do that, uh, God is pleased with what we have done. If not, then we try to take the law of the word and twist it and turn it and interpret it the way we want to, write our own book more or less, like a lot of people do. Uh, that's not uh, that's not what God wants. He wants us to do it to use it the way He intended us to use it. So Jesus asked him, How do you read the law? What does the law say? Somebody read 27 28. He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied, Do this and you will live. Amen. <clears throat> the scribe in question Jesus is a good example of the need to have more than head knowledge of the word. You'll be reading there where you're supposed to be a a hearer of the word and a doer of the word. And just having knowledge of the scripture is not enough. I've seen people make movies and uh, songs or whatever about the word, but you know they have the head knowledge of the word, but not the actual understanding of it. And there's a difference. And like, you know, a lot of people have a head knowledge of Jesus. They say, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I believe Jesus was here and all that. But they don't have a, a heart knowledge of Jesus. They know that he existed. Uh, know what he stood for, but in no means, form, or fashion do they follow him and believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and he is the only way to heaven. They just believe he was he was here and, and that kind of a thing, but they don't uh, have no desire to follow and believe. Like a lot of people Jesus talked to in his day, the scribes and the Pharisees, they uh, believed the Messiah was coming, but they didn't believe that he was here. <clears throat> but Jesus told them that... Uh, yeah, I was saying, you know, he, he understands the law, and well, knows what the law is, and knows what he's expect, what he's uh, expected to do. And then Jesus told him, well, if you know that the Word says this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, then go and do likewise, and love your neighbor as yourself. And they, you know, we know a lot of people weren't doing that, especially the religious leaders. So Jesus is telling me, if you know it, and you understand what the law is, how do you, how do you? Uh, get eternal life, go and do what you know, and you'll get eternal life. It tells us in uh, Deuteronomy also, it says the same thing, back in the Old Testament. Uh, to love the Lord God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. And then in Leviticus, it also tells them to uh, love their neighbor as yourself. It's not a new commandment, a new law, just comes from Jesus. It's been around from, from day one, even back, even back in the Levitical law, to love your neighbor as yourself. And sometimes that could be a, a challenge like we had talked about, about loving somebody you don't know or <clears throat> don't particularly care for. And an example was James, some strange person on the side of the road and didn't know him from Adam. But he stopped, took his time, took his talent, and he helped somebody. Uh, with no expectation of any kind of reward. He just done it out of the love out of his heart. He did it. And it was a good example for us to do in the world today. We, they teach them the Boy Scouts to do a good deed every day. Uh, and that's a good example of it. To go out and just share the love. And sometimes when we share in that love in some form or fashion, we can also give us the opportunity to share the gospel with people. And tell them that we're doing this for the, uh, <clears throat> you know, because uh, God is, dwells, in, dwells inside of us. An example of that is I was at work one day, there was a guy, <clears throat> older fella, uh, handicapped, couldn't get around a lot, didn't have a lot of family come around and visit him. And I was there uh, cleaning his drain out from the roof. And I noticed his gutters were just packed full of leaves, they were hanging, about to fall off. So, I mean, I didn't have to, but I took the time since I was on the roof anyway. It was a small house. I went out and got some trash bags from him, and I cleaned all the stuff out of his gutters and cleaned them up. And he said, asked me why I did that. 
And I told him, I said, it's in the Word. I said, you know, the, God tells us that when we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And he just, you know, he was bewildered by me taking the time uh, to do that and not expecting any money, not charging him for it, just showing the love of God, taking the opportunity that I had because it was easy for me to do while I was there, uh, just to help him out. And, uh, and you know, like I said, you know, when the love of God is inside of us and we're full of it, full of God, full of love, then it'll just flow out of you. That's uh, something you have to think about or talk about or be, you know, oh my God, twist your arm to do it. <laughs> you'll, uh, you'll just do it. It'll just come out of your natural. <laughs> and most people, even the unbelievers know uh, that when you take your time and you do something really good for somebody else, it makes you feel good on the inside. Because you know you're doing a good thing and the Lord is pleased with it. So even if you're not a believer, you still get, uh, in a sense, you get a reward for helping somebody else. Doing a good thing for it. And God wants us to do that, to love each other, to love our neighbor as ourselves, and to love Him first and foremost. And we do that by the way we are, uh, treat ourselves and the way we treat others. And especially in believers, when we read all this stuff and we study this and we learn it, we are accountable to God for our everyday actions. Every word that we say, every deed that we do, everything that we do, we are accountable to God because we know that God's watching us. People are watching us too, but we know that we're accountable to God for all that we do. Our everyday life is a can we're we hold accountable to God. Every day we do and we don't do. Yep. Sins of omission and sins of uh, commission. Yeah, when we have yeah. the opportunity and we don't take it, it's I don't know, I just kinda think I have a red slash over my head whenever I don't. Yeah. All the ghost getting back is when we uh, you know should do something and we don't do it, feel guilty about it. Mm -hmm. The Lord will help us through our everyday life if we let him, to the good, the bad, and the ugly. Just to uh, you know, speak words of truth. And, uh, and, and right thinking is not just good enough. You've got to do more than think right. you got to do right. You know, think right and you got to do right. And God is pleased with that if we do so. Somebody read uh, 29 through 35. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounding him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down the road, then, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Sumerian, as he so journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, poured oil and wine, and set him on his own animal, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, and gave to the innkeeper and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these do you think was his neighbor who fell among the thieves? Mm -hmm. oh, no. okay. <clears throat> yeah. So this, um, like, you know, the words of the guy trying to justify himself because he wasn't living what he knew he was supposed to live. He knew the law, but he wasn't living the law. A lot of the Jewish people back then, they believed that, uh, well, they tried to believe that when the word says, treat your neighbor and love your neighbor as yourself, that that word neighbor referred to somebody who was in their own, you know, little uh, little thing right there. Anybody sat outside of, that wasn't a Jewish, that they weren't considered neighbors, if you weren't a Jew, and they didn't have to treat you, they didn't have to love you like you're supposed to love yourself because you weren't a Jewish nation. So that they tried to twist the word, <clears throat> but if they read the whole thing of Leviticus, they, it breaks it down where God's not talking about just immediate people or somebody of your own race, religion, creed, or whatever, but he's talking about the whole world. Those outside, uh, those even that don't believe in God, the unbelievers, the whoever, that we're supposed to love them as well.
and show the love of Christ in our everyday life to them, just like this gentleman right here did. How are we going to grow the kingdom if we don't show the love of God to the unsaved? I don't Yeah, it'd be this little group right here, and that'll be it. Us no more. <laughs> yeah, we're supposed to share it uh, with the world. That's a really good story. And, uh, it's a good example. You know, most people assume that the fellow that was on the ground being beat up, that he was a Jewish person. And there's a reason why the religious leader shouldn't have you know, took a at least a few minutes to check on them to help them out and do something with it, but they just, you know, they ain't got time, too busy. Yeah. Like a lot of people in the world today are so busy with life. Yeah. Well, what was explained to me earlier this week by one of the people I was listening or watching, um, he said uh, part of the excuse that the priests had on there is that the man looked like he was dying or dead already, so he didn't want to defile himself by touching him and making himself unclean. And thus the um, Levite did the same thing. However, he also elaborated on what you were saying on there. We should still had checked on the individual and if there was life in there, we should be doing everything we can to preserve it. Okay, well, there was... yeah, I, see if he was still moving. I can't speak said, hey, come over here. in the Bible, but I mean, I know now People will stop by on the road and check on an animal before they'll check on a person. Yep. You know, and I mean, I love animals, don't get me wrong, but, you know, people are worried about, you know, PETA and all this kind of stuff, and I know this is going to be online, but, uh, I mean, you know, I'm all for saving the animals and all that kind of stuff, but, like, we have babies being killed every single day. We have people on, on the streets every single day that don't know where their next meal are going to go, and we're worried about animals. And I'm like, yeah. there's something, we're just a warped society. I mean, our brains are just... Yeah, priorities are wrong. Yeah, wrong I mean... Yeah. yeah, that's right, yeah. You have to um, love each other, love your neighbor as yourself. You get to hear that... Uh, you know, Samaritans were uh, uh, unlike people uh, uh, by the Jews they, because they, you know, they were left behind at the Exodus and, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, and you know, they intermarried with the Gentiles and they became a Samaritan. They thought they were just a, you know, a dirty, low-life people, so they had nothing to do with the Samaritans. But the Samaritan was the only person that helped. Uh, it seemed like the Samaritan, even though he wasn't appreciated and loved by the the Jewish nation, he was more godly than the Jewish leaders were. Mm -hmm. uh, he took the time to help his neighbor out. And I guess both these guys were uh, uh, taking that, you know, Nazarite vow or whatever, uh, to not touch anything dead, if that was an excuse. Or they could have been saying that, well, you know, look, you know, I got people waiting on me, they're expecting me right here. I ain't got time for this, I gotta go. You know, I, gotta, I gotta teach, I gotta preach, or I gotta uh, do something. Well, I just want to get their hands dirty one or the other. I'm not sure what the real excuse was, but... People must not have been nosy back then, either. Yeah. And so, people can uh, come up with a, a variety of excuses to not do what God has called us to do, unfortunately. Even in the world today, people have excuses and reasons for not, to, not obeying the Word. Uh, and Get a variety of them. Somebody read uh, James, you read 36 to 37. Yeah. So, which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fall among the thieves? And he said, He who showed uh, show mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. And then you have a question that the uh, scribe had uh, proposed to Jesus and turned out to be a valuable lesson for the uh, scribe himself. So Jesus was breaking the law down for him and explaining to him what exactly what that meant. Now his interpretation was that if this uh, parable, uh, as the Samaritan went out and took his time, took his money, went to great effort to help this stranger he knew nothing about. He was being a neighbor to him. And he expected him to go do likewise. Somebody, even though he was <clears throat> a Jewish leader, and they detested the Samaritans and other people that weren't just, uh, you know, weren't Jews. Jesus telling him doesn't matter whether he's a Jew or not a Jew. You go out and you love everybody, stranger, friend, family, whoever it is, and you take whatever you have to do to show that love. This guy here took his time, took his, his talent, took his money. 
put them in a motel. It may not have been the Marriott, but you know, at least it was a you know a motel six or something. Put them in there and gave them money to be taken care of so they could feed him and get him back on his feet and get him healthy. And he's paying for all of it. Now I'm sure he wasn't expecting the money back from that guy. He was taking what he had, and maybe he was well off and he could afford to do it. And he was spending it to help his fellow out, just to show the love of God. Or it could have been his last dollars. Never yeah, we don't know. It doesn't say. He said, I'll give you this much. If it's more, I'll give you more when I come back. And maybe that was his last dime. And he was uh, going to bring some more back when he came. So when he was a regular around there. The guy knew him and trusted him. And he was a frequent flyer, so to speak. He came there quite often for business or pleasure, or we don't know, but you know, really he, was, uh, he was well known by the individual. But he was showing the love of God, even though he wasn't a Jew. He was a Samaritan, despised by the Jews, but he was still showing love. And it's a good example for us to follow today. So we don't know, stranger, whatever, help him out. Take your time, change your tire. Uh, whatever it may be, uh, give him a jump, and don't expect nothing in return. Just do it because you're, uh, the love just flowing out of you to the world around us. And I know and we know, everybody knows, that if everybody in the world took the time to let that love flow out of them and help each other out when we had a need, and not be saying, oh, well, give me uh, 20 bucks and I'll give you a jump. Uh, you know, uh, 50 bucks, I'll change the tire. Give me some money, you know, that's, that's not what God expects. If everybody took the time and let that love flow out of them and just give and give and give or whatever we have to everybody else, what a beautiful place the world would be. It would be, uh, be grand. That's not the way it is. Not uh, in all of the world anyway. But, you know, we, uh, we do what we can as we should. And I believe that if we, every day if we get with the mindset that I'm going to go out today, I'm going to love the Lord, I'm going to show the Lord that I love Him, I'm going to love others, let the love of God come out of me. When we lay down in bed at night, we can rest assured that God is pleased with what we have done. And give us a good night's sleep. And then he'll, uh, he'll bless us in such a way. Uh, Brother Tommy, would you read uh, 38 through 40? Now it came to this, as he went, that he entered to a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also said, and Jesus speak and heard his word. My mother was covered about what serving and came to him and said, Lord, does thou not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Be it her therefore that she help me. Yeah, you know, I made a story that Jesus came around and you know, back then it was important, I guess, came to your house that you, you know, you, you, you serve them quickly. You give them something to eat, something to drink, and you make sure they're comfortable and, you know, treat your guests right. Put your guests above yourself. So this was uh, her main concern. And, uh, you know, Jesus was there, probably the disciples, and <clears throat> maybe some people that had just came just to be following Jesus, and they wanted to hear him speak. So she's trying to, you know, tend to the crowd. There might be, been, you know, 5, 10, 15 people there. We don't know how many people was there, but I'm sure she's running back and forth to the kitchen, back and forth, cooking, preparing, getting ready, going to the cupboard, getting stuff out of the pantry, and everything else getting prepared for everybody, trying to make sure everybody's comfortable getting you know, pillows on the couch or whatever it may be on the floor, or you know, throw blankets or <laughs> place mats or whatever it is, trying to get prepared. And, you know, she's not used to handling that many people. And her sister's there, and her sister's just sitting there, I'm just sitting there on the couch, I'm sitting on the floor, just you know, looking at Jesus and talking to him. And she's getting frustrated and frustrated because she's still busy trying to do it all. <laughs> so she comes, she's probably angry with Jesus and with her sister. Because Jesus is not telling her to get up and help her prepare, which was, you know, what women did back then, and, and today as well. And, uh, and imagine her sister for not helping her out. And Jesus is trying to uh, straighten her out and uh, get her to understand that, you know, it's important that we treat our guests properly. That we, you know, serve them, make them comfortable. But what's more important is while he is there to listen to his word, because he had the lessons of life and death. He had the lessons of goodness and righteousness in his heart and in his mind, and he was sharing with the world around him. So at that minute, at that time, the treating your guests and preparing for your guests was not as important. It took second place 
for what Mary was doing. She had took the most important part by taking the time to listen to the words of Christ, to be educated, to be informed, to be encouraged and inspired by what he was going to say. Because she knew that what he was going to say would affect her, the rest of her life. Because it affects the rest of our life. When we are new Christian and we start learning and we start studying the Word, we're taking the time to put that Word inside it. We know that what we learn, if we learn it and we live it, it's going to affect the rest of our life and everybody else's life as well. An example of like this, it makes me think about when I first got born again, first got saved, and I was so hungry for the Word. Every day I come home from work, and the first thing I do is I would grab my Bible and I would start reading. And I would sit there for hours and read and study and read and study to learn. And something my wife would come to me and she said, Hey, when are you going to start reading this Bible? Cut the grass or something, do something around the house. And that's true, I was somewhat neglecting my duties. And I was so hungry for the Word. And to me, what I was reading and what I was learning and what I was studying, I knew what it was going to do to me and to my family. So to me, it was more important to me to take the time and study this Word than it was to do other things. And she was doing the same thing. She was taking what she thought was more important, Mary was, to listening to Jesus and receiving and consuming His words. Because she knew how it would affect her and the rest of her life. So she done the uh, done the best thing. Then after he maybe he spoke for a while, didn't take a take the time she could get up and go help her sister, uh, feed everybody and give them something to drink and that kind of thing. But the most important thing was listening. Everything in moderation. Yeah. Everything's got to be done decently in order. Mm -hmm. Right thing at the right time. Yeah. And that's what she was doing right there. She was doing the right thing. And I'm sure it paid off. I'm sure it was a good lesson for her sister as well. But Jesus, first and foremost in your life, everything else can come second. Everything else can fall into place. Now, that doesn't mean that we're supposed to get up every day and spend all day in prayer and all day reading, all, read, all day reading the Word, not go to work and make a living for ourselves, not do our duty. We're supposed to do that first. But first and foremost, we put God first and foremost in our life. And everything else will fall into place after that. Uh, Mr. Kelly, would you read 41? Forty-two. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, her sister was trying to condemn her for what she was doing, and Jesus was letting her know she done the right thing, Mary. Uh, she done the right thing. She didn't uh, do nothing wrong. And don't condemn her for it. Uh, it would be wise for you to do likewise. Just take a minute, take a break. Sit down and listen to me. Uh, take a break in our everyday life and study the Word. Uh, spend time in prayer. And uh, when we do that, we know how it can affect the rest of our day and the rest of our life. Uh, it can make a difference. I know there's time that uh, a lot of people know that you get up in the morning, you spend time in prayer. You get up in the morning, you study some scripture, read some Word. It can affect your character, your attitude, and uh, your mental, uh, mental thoughts. And it can affect the rest of your day. It can put you in a proper state of mind that makes the rest of the day fall into place. Everything works easier that way. Like Tommy was saying earlier, in his prayer that you know, in our, in our daily life, we're going to face struggles and trials and temptations and complications and problems. But we also know that if we believe and trust in the Lord, He's going to help us through each and every one of them. Mm -hmm. And the Word says that you know, things are going to happen in our life, but the Lord will deliver us out of all of them. If we look to Him to do so, not look to ourselves. He can help us out when we uh, can't find no help anywhere else. Uh, a good example was that time I uh, told you about when I fell and I couldn't get up. But I cried out to God and He gave me the strength to get up. And if I had to cry out to Him, I would have laid here all the time. I don't know, but uh, thanks to the Lord, in spite of what had happened, it wasn't His fault, it was my fault. But in spite of what had happened, He was there and He helped me through it. And you know, he's, he's there with us today, helping us through all that we go through. Whether there are problems up here, problems in our heart, or just problems in our body, or problems in our everyday life, at work, at home, at church, he can help us through them all. You just have to lay, the, lay at his feet and believe that he wants us to, to live a good life. He wants us to live a happy life. He wants us to be full of joy. So he'll help us through the things that we go through to make sure that happens, if we believe and trust in him. And rely on them. And lean not on our own understanding, but in all 
our ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct our paths. He will give us courage when we need it, strength when we need it, wisdom when, wisdom when we need it. Uh, he can help us out all the day long. Uh, we can't have a, a lack of trust in God. We've got to have a, a constant trust in God and believe and trust in Him. Jesus taught that love must be the motivating factor in our lives. Loving God and loving others requires us to prioritize both our time and our resources. Being busy must not distract us from loving God or from reaching out to the needy among us. Uh, like we were saying about studying the Word and praying, we can't spend all of our time doing that because we have to spend our time doing other things, making a living for ourselves, helping each other out, uh, spend time praying for each other. And, uh, it's God's will for our life that we uh, forsake our own self uh, when need be, and put others in front of us, especially uh, God first and foremost. And then make all the difference in our life and the difference in somebody else's life as well when we do that. And God will be well pleased with it. Thank you, Lord. We got to a minute early. Uh, 60 seconds, maybe. <laughs> make a comment. Okay. Quite often, especially young converts come in and get involved in church work and want to please God. Next thing you know, um, somebody want to offer them a position or whatever, they're really not qualified, but they need somebody to fill it. And so that person may jump right in there and try to uh, do the best he can under the circumstances. If we're not careful, we so be so involved in working for the Lord and doing various tasks and whatever, that we don't take the time to pray and to seek God for our own benefit that causes us to grow and prosper in the Lord. And I might seem foolish, but I've seen that situation that happened in my life at one time. I was so involved in doing things. I was a Sunday school superintendent. I taught a class. I taught on Wednesday night, involved in scouts and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I finally realized you need to let somebody else do something which would help the church, and I needed to spend more time reading and studying God's Word myself. The thing that happens there is you leave the church burnout. People go, you know what, I'm doing everything, and I don't want to do anything anymore. You I'm just going to go home. You just get caught in that situation. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> That's why we're very thankful we have a great deacon board and great elders and great workers in the church because, you know, this hospital stay kind of put Josh in a place where he, he finally just said, I can't do everything. I can't, I can't, you know, I've got to delegate, I've got to, and he's not ever had to be in that position. But, you know, from an early child, they put you in a youth position, they put you in a Sunday school position that because they see you're an eager worker and you get, you get put in and we've been there. I mean, like, in my early 20s, I said, I don't want to go to church. I did not want to go. I did not want to have any. I went because my mama made me. You know what I mean? Like, I was still living in my mama and daddy's house. But but it was like, every time the doors were open, you were doing something. And it got to the point where, I, by, between work, school, and church, I didn't have time to actually know what was in the Bible. I was doing it, but I didn't know what was there. And I didn't have a relationship with them. Where now, you know, you, you have to find that teetering scale, you know. That's why it out, yeah. So important for us to make the time to pray and to read God's Word and study for ourselves. Because I've, I've had some circumstances in my life and whatever that um, when I first got married, I was involved in church work. I, 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 I got saved when I was right after I got married and um, involved in a whole lot of difficulties and um, really won't make enough money to meet the need and to be married and that kind of thing. And, but nevertheless, we got to the situation and we had two, two children to come along and um, I came home, my wife was sitting in the living room crying. So what's the matter? She says, rain for two days. 
got babies in diapers. That's before they had disposables. <laughs> she said, I've washed everything, got to wash, and I walked in the room in the breezeway and she had everything lined up from one end to the other. And uh, I, I sat down after that praying and began to read God's Word and come across that uh, pastor that he was a part of my was according to his riches and glory. The Lord spoke to me right then and said, go to Sears and buy you a dryer. <laughs> so I went and bought a dryer. <clears throat> well, I went to the store to buy a dryer. Whenever I told her, I said, ma'am, I want to tell you what the circumstances are. And I did. I said, I hadn't been uh, married that long. I hadn't really got established in that kind of thing like you all team. I said, but... <clears throat> I was praying to God about the circumstances and he told me to come up here and I could buy uh, a dryer for uh, for a house. That lady said, let me fill out an application for me that year. She looked at that. She said, Mr. Madden, there's no way in the world that I can give you the credit to do what you need in order to get a drive because of your lack of finances and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. As a ma'am, I'm truthful with you on the application. As I'll tell you, I have never beat anybody out of a dime. And I, you can rest assured that as long as I'm living, I'll make sure that you get your money. She said, based on the statement you give, I'm going to go ahead and give you, <laughs> let you get that. Uh, that drive, which I did. There's a the Lord. Mm -hmm. So, uh, she, evidently the Lord spoke to her like he told me. He said, go get it. <laughs> that you can have it. Of course, I didn't buy a brand new one. I got a used one. But nevertheless, that thing worked for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they don't make them like they used to. Uh, now that they last three years. <laughs> I know I sound old when I say that, but I grew up with an old Kenmore. And I loved that thing. And then when I got grown, we had to buy one for the house. And I cried. Because <laughs> it, it lasted three years. And then we had to buy another one. I said, what happened? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was just little time. Yeah, God does that. I mean, even today, uh, he does that. He'll, uh, he'll speak to somebody. And he'll, and he, you know, did it back then. And he'll speak to somebody. He'll speak to somebody else. So they'll, uh, and they'll, they'll get together and. God's will be accomplished. God answer our prayers in some form or fashion. And, uh, that was a, you know, a good testimony today. Appreciate that. Why is Chesapeake so expensive to live? <laughs> Why is it so expensive to live in Chesapeake? It's not only in Chesapeake. It, it's all over. But it's like cheaper in Norfolk and Suffolk than it is in Chesapeake. But you got to look at the areas that is the cheapest. Oh yeah, yeah just it's like the it's high cheaper. crime rate. I could get a really nice house. Yeah, just like it's cheaper where I live on there, but my property taxes went up five hundred dollars this year. Oh, that was a big jump okay. from what I've been That's used to. Really well, there's nothing to rent out towards your way. Yeah, I didn't look six hundred dollars. Well, I, I was I was fighting that at one time, and then whenever I retired, I went down to the city and I said, "You understand, y'all have a." Uh, can give a break to people who's not making the X number of dollars or whatever on their taxes. Mm -hmm. The lady said, that depends on what you're making and that kind of thing. So I filled out the paperwork and when I filled the thing out, turned it in. She said, you can save 200 something dollars a year mm. on your tax. My daddy did the same thing when he mm. retired. Because he, he, he took a, a cut when he retired. Right. And um, he did the same thing. He said, I can't, I, I can't, I can't pay that. Yeah. You know, because yeah, I'm living off of a disability and a Navy retirement. That that's it. Yeah. So it, it it took us months to come up with the. Well, they decided taxes. they're gonna go up on our rent at the apartment over here by a hundred dollars. So we got now till March to find another place to live. So y'all start praying. Because mm -hmm. I have been on every app, every search engine I can find to find a cheaper yeah. place to live. Occasionally they do have like a trailer or something that's for rent, but I haven't heard anything that we recently, but we'll keep you in eye. Well, that, and we have a dog, and nobody wants, he's not, he's not a vicious breed, yeah. but he's not 35 pounds. He's 60. Turn around, turn him into a pro. 
<laughs> Turn him into a what? A service dog. Like they, oh. they, can't, they can't say anything. Mm. He's not far away from being a service dog. Because <laughs> if I have to get rid of him, my nerves are going to be shocked. <laughs> I've, had, I've had him since he was a baby and he, he sleeps with me. He does everything with me. So. But, yeah, we... Just be expensive. <laughs> yeah. We didn't realize how expensive it was till we got here, but God brought us here for a reason. So I'd like to be closing prayer right quick. Yeah, me Father, I thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for this class, Lord. I ask you to bless it and help it grow spiritually and physically, Lord. And I ask you to help uh, Pastor and his wife find a nice permanent home. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord. And a nice safe neighborhood, Lord. Yes. And I ask you to bless the service that we're about to attend, Lord. That we give you all the honor and glory. I ask it in your holy name. Amen. 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 Amen.